Tonight, I wanted to start with the story of how I even came across you. Um, Cause it's kind this of funny. I was so wonderful and crazy. This has to be spam. Like there's no way <laughs> somebody put all this work into covering my song. Like instantly, like there's, there's some weird AI Right. thing happening and then you play the whole thing and i was like no this is real this is like a guy <laughs> is real. who is there is i still make great music oh yeah i got a dog hanging out here My too she's he's hearing some people outside uh, yeah let's say like a uh a zoo with magical creatures we are at the zoo the animals are sparkling too you can feel it in the sunshine da -da -da. like that's not very good but, um, but you just start making stuff up like that. And so, hey, everybody who, uh, thanks for checking in. Um, I've got Jackson Emmer here with me, um, a, a great musician out of Carbondale, correct? Carbondale, Colorado. Carbondale, Colorado. So um, not too far um, from me, I'm in Denver. Um, and so we're gonna chat through some things, some of uh, his kind of history, musical history, uh, things that got him going, um, some of his process, uh, and hopefully you come away inspired um, to write your next song or to keep going uh, in music. Um, so uh, Jackson, I wanted to start with the story of how I even came across you. Um, cause it's kind this of funny. I was so wonderful and crazy. It, yeah. It, it's kind of, uh, it was, I was dumbfounded. It was, um, I, I live in a complex and there is a, a coffee shop bar that, um, has a music venue on the side and I was on my way to the grocery store and, and my way back. Uh, and I was just awestruck by Jackson was playing some songs and I thought they were so impressive. Um, started with his voice, but the lyrics are what get me to be honest. And I, I'll bring this up later, but I'm, I'm really glad you put lyrics on your website um, mm. and delineate them out because most artists don't do that. And I, f I find yours to be so good and fun to like to, to, to dive through. And so it was nice to have them all in one place. Um, yeah. And so for, I stayed for caring about them at all. I, I love, I truly, I love the storytelling aspect of it. It's there's so much there. Um, and um so yeah and i was sitting there and i watched the show i guess for free i'm sorry i think it cost money i didn't realize that i really didn't know that they did that so i'm it's sorry really, it's really fine yeah um but don't, the next time worry. i will be a paying customer um but um the uh and so yeah we i kind of sat there and then i i couldn't get one of the songs out of my head so i i just covered it and played it back um for people because i figured they'd like it too and and hopefully they would go check Jackson out. Um, so, um, and you, and you sent it to me and like, it's this video and you're talking directly to me. And I was like, this has to be spam. Like there's no way <laughs> somebody put all this work into covering my song, like instantly, like there's, there's some weird AI right. thing happening. And then you play the whole thing. And I was like, no, this is real. This is like a guy <laughs> this is real. who is this there is real thing. <laughs> and he got into it and he just happens to be really good at all this computering and production stuff. So, it's um, kind of funny. Um, it was such a it was such a joy and a treat to see. So good, I'm, I'm so happy. That. I I because for me it was such a joy to hear all of your music and and I really just thought it was so magical and so um, I was like I got to get this one under the fingers in some way whether you know and then I couldn't stop and then I went the whole for the whole thing. So that's so uh, cool. it was a lot of fun. It was funny because you're I, I'm not a natural singer. I just try, but your voice is so good and so smooth. And I was I tried. I probably tried like 50 different takes just to get that voice. Cause you got this like nice, nice kind of like soulful, like kind of smooth voice. And I was like trying to overdo it. And it, it's, it's, that's something that, you know, you can't teach. You can't teach well, that. I don't think of myself as a natural singer either. Um, you know, it took me years of sucking to, um, to be able to, to do this at all. And, um, something we haven't talked about is I, I used to be like a barroom singer and I would play like three or four hour sets primarily around Aspen. Um, so high elevation, like 8,000 mm -hmm. feet. Yep. And I torched my voice and it was just like completely gone. I couldn't talk oh. for almost two months and I had to relearn how to sing. And because of that, um, I, I had to relearn how to sing in an extra relaxed supported way where like, my vocal, like I used to have a pretty big vocal range, but again, I would like blow it out in different places and now it's more limited, but I just kind of have to like always 
hang out in a very comfortable place to deliver it all. And I think having to relearn how to do it, um, is the reason you, you hear what you hear now and, um, why you're into it at all. But like it's, yeah. it took, it was a long time coming and it wasn't like I grew up singing. I just, that actually makes me so happy to hear in some, some ways. Um, just mm. because singing can feel like this, like kind of like something in the distance, this unreachable mountain that some people just happen to be on. Um, but, um, and I've, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I've now done a ton of YouTube and, and things just trying to figure out if there's a way to, to become somewhat passable, but, um, I'm glad to hear it's a, it's a process and it takes work and it's a mm -hmm. skill just like any other instrument, um, which I think gets, um, some people just think you can't and then are done with it. So that's interesting to hear. It's really, I, I went to college with several good singers and before then I just played guitar and I never sang. And I remember putting on one of their records they like made in their dorm room and it was just like, starts with all vocals, harmonies and just really hit me his name's trevor wilson and just the sound of it was like oh my god i'm never gonna play guitar in a way that like gets to the heart as much as the voice does so i decided then i would start singing and i was i think i was 20 and i was like and i more people i talked to like they started singing when they were like let's say 10 and so by the time they were 20 they were they were pretty good at it and i was mm -hmm. like okay i've got 10 years of sucking to do I better start today yeah. <laughs> or I'm, or it's just not going to happen. So yeah. And that, that was pretty much true. Uh, I had a not good sounding voice for 10 years. And then when I hit 30, um, it started coming into focus and now it, it's, it sounds so good now. Thank you. you. It's, it really does. I'm trying to make the most of what working. I have, which is, yeah, <laughs> well, we, uh, that's, if we could all do that, then we'd be all be in a great place. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, that is really insightful. That's great to hear because that inspires me in a lot of ways. Um, I did want to kind of get into just a quick rundown of your history. Did you, so you're a guitar player. Did you kind of, were you kind of playing since 12 or did you do anything formally? I'm just curious where you started. Yeah, I am. Um, I heard Jimi Hendrix at an all school meeting in middle school and I didn't know that that was a guitar. I just like knew I liked the sound and I started asking around. My parents were a little bit older, I think. They had me when they were like 40. So like just the mismatch of what they were into versus what was on the radio and what my friends were listening to. There were a lot of gaps that I had to fill or to bridge, I should say. So um, so I heard Jimi Hendrix and I was like, what is that? Like, what does that sound even? And my friends were like, that's an electric guitar, idiot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm getting one. Like, I got, you know, so... I, uh, I saved up. It took me like a year or two. Cause I was very, I'm sure if I asked my parents, they would have bought me a guitar, but, but I was very much like, this is my secret project and I'm going to do it myself. And, you know, anyway, so I, I did eventually get, um, an electric guitar when I was 15 and, um, started going over to my friend's garage where he had like a, you know, he had a band and they're playing punk and ska. And, uh, I was just like, cool, I'll just do that. Whatever I can do anything, you know, they had spare time to show me. I would do, I started picking up guitar magazines. This was the early days of getting tabs online and mm -hmm. they were awful. Um, but I didn't know better. So I just, I mean, I ate, I ate it all up. And so I started when I was 15 and I played very few lessons, mostly reading magazines and asking yeah. anyone I ran into for advice, um, until I was in college. And then in college I was studying animation and drawing, but I wasn't frankly that into it or focused and my professors noticed and they were like what are you thinking about like what do you care about and I was like I really just want to play music but you can't have a job playing music you'll never make any money so I gotta focus on this animation stuff and they were like you think you got a better shot making money <laughs> in animation like that's not this is ins you're not thinking about this clearly like just do whatever you're into into and um and it it could work out for you and so that's what I did. I changed my major. I started studying music. I also started playing a few other instruments. Um, so mandolin was my main instrument for several oh, wow. years. And I played in like bluegrass and old time bands and cool. even like jazz and, um, you know, French, yeah, for like French jazz, like they call it gypsy swing. I, I know because you have a couple songs that have that inspire that kind of French gypsy inspiration. Mm. I remember you played one. Um, and I was like, 
because that's one of my favorite styles as well. So I was like, this guy knows. Yeah, there's a real, it's so cool. The right hand rhythm in that is, I would say, very similar to Western swing, you know, mm -hmm. like the Bob Wills stuff um, that came out of like New Orleans and New York uh, jazz and then like musicians in Texas and L.A. seeing that and being like, well, let's do our own cowboy version of that. Yeah. Um, so just like the right hand stuff that it takes to do it was something that I had kind of been working on. And there's just so many cool ways that all that intersects. But um, that's kind of a long way of saying that I just loved playing guitar and I loved learning about music and I ate up as much of it as I could prior to me learning uh, or writing any songs or even singing. Got it. Um, it how, what do you feel about... Um, music theory. It's been interesting to hear different people talk about it. Um, how important is it to you personally? And then, uh, and how much you spend time on it? And then do you think it's necessary for people making music? I'm going to drink some water before I answer that. Yeah. Okay. Music theory. I think music theory is great. I learned a lot of it in college and focused on, um, just like basic stuff and then on up into jazz theory, like extended harmonies and modes mm -hmm. and mashing up of different rhythms, which also happens um, a lot in like classical notation and, and classical like composition or mm -hmm. notated compositions. Um, I think music theory is great. I think that people are really scared of it. And I think that that's unfortunate. Like it can be intimidating, but it's very difficult to talk about sound if you don't know any music theory. Music theory is just a way to, um, to talk about sound and music. And um, I find that it's very helpful for communicating with other musicians. It's helpful for communicating with other musicians who come from a different musical background than me. Um, like if somebody is more classically trained and they're not into country, <laughs> blues, western swing, you know, but you can talk about uh, your key signatures or uh, time signatures or whatever you, way you want to chart things out. It's a way of bringing in other people into your world and like bridging the communication gap. And the communication gap is like, what music have you listened to? Have you played? And are you familiar with? Um, so being savvy with theory is a great way to communicate with other players. And I think level up the musicianship that you're able to do. A lot of musicians are not very comfortable with music theory and don't use it, and they still make great music. Oh, yeah. I got a dog hanging out here, My too. She's... He's hearing some people outside. Yeah. Hey, buddy. That's great. Um, what's your dog's name? Ziggy. Hi, Ziggy. Zig. Um, so, yeah, I don't think you need music theory to make great music, but I do think it's helpful in so many occasions and i think it can help you get from like pretty good music to great music faster if you're able to communicate effectively with the people you're working with yeah and yeah that's my spiel I, I agree i i find it fast endlessly fascinating it's also i'm obsessed with it i think to your point what i love most about it is not necessarily i don't know if i necessarily use it if i'm creating something per se but i do love the idea that I could break, understand a genre and understand the core components of it and why like the harmonies are being used and the rhythms that are being used and being able to recreate that style much faster. Uh, it's just like, it's a nice tool to have mm -hmm. in the toolbox. I, I really enjoy it. I love that it, it's a never ending thing. And then, uh, I also realize, like at the end of the day, when you get to the end of it, it's really just, it's like this imperfect representation of of music it'll never be kind of like exactly perfect but it's so helpful and then to your point i'm sure communicating with other musicians makes makes it that much easier get on the same page yeah like what key is something in uh what are the chord changes and what are the chord changes in numbers numbers are really helpful because if you switch keys all of a sudden you move your capo up one mm -hmm. oh no you got to come up with a whole new set of letters that right even for great musicians can be unnecessarily confusing. So the Nashville number system is really helpful to know. Um, and then like just how many measures is this section? Is there something unusual about this section where you've added in two beats? Like you don't have to think about all that consciously as you create it. But like you said, after you've made it, if you have to 
focus on a moment, hone it in or like explain it to somebody, it's really good to be able to listen and go like, okay, this is what's happening here. Blah, totally. blah, blah. And then someone can write it down and then, you know, it doesn't take 50 takes to get it right because they can read their little chart that they made based on what you told them. And what you told them is right because you know music theory. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, no, I, I find it to be just such a fun thing to like get the next absorption of like extended jazz harmonies and how those are fitting. And then you're, you know, you're not, you're playing non diatonically. I, I think it's, mm-hmm. fun. it's really fun. Yeah. And not everything right can like be easily explained too. So like you said, it's, I, I guess it comes off like music theory is like, let's put everything in a box that you can explain. Right. But like, it's just sort of like suggestions and checkpoints and you do your best and then you enjoy the music. Yeah, yeah. totally. I couldn't agree more. Um, in terms of your creative process, what's that like? Let's say like, for instance, if you're writing a song, do you typically start a certain way or is it, is it kind of infinitely changeable? I'm just curious how you, how you begin and mm. work through it. Well, I usually, I, I write, I would say in seasons, uh, for one, like not seasons of the year, but just like for three months straight, I'll write one or two or three songs a week. And I will just always be kind of into that or having it in the back of my mind. I also make dates to write songs. So like for a lot of last year was every Friday at 8am, I got on zoom and I wrote a song with my friend Tom and, um, and we like would work for an hour. Yeah. You, you heard about one. that? Uh, you uh, mentioned it in your, on your set. In your oh, okay. Set. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. One. That's very helpful. The, yeah. the deadline of when the accountability is really helpful. Um, but when it comes to the actual like writing of it, um, I think I've found a couple ways that, that work well for me. One is just titles or ideas, you know, like, um, I have a running list on my phone and it would be like, uh, what was it? Snowflake, snowflakes in the streetlights, you know, uh, river stones, Walkman bumping, you know, like just, you make a little list of things that you think are compelling. And then when it's time to write, you look at your list and you go, what of these is interesting to me? And then you just start making stuff up. Right. And, uh, when I make stuff up, I just will start singing, you know, it could just be like, can you give me like a, an idea or a theme? Uh, yeah, let's say like a, uh, a zoo with magical creatures. We are at the zoo. The animals are sparkling too. You can feel it in the sunshine. Like that's not very good, but, um, but you just start making stuff up like that and, and play, you know, just play around with the ideas and see what, I just see what comes to me. And, um, sometimes what comes to me is garbage and sometimes what comes to me is, is fun and interesting. Mm -hmm. And I also, I do that a lot in my mind without actually singing. You know, I just am always kind of like someone's in the cul-de-sac and they're driving around and they don't turn back because the truck just drove by, you know, like (laughs) that stuff is just happening in my mind. And so I'm regularly just kind of like, okay, that was stupid. Okay. That was stupid. Okay. That was stupid. Or I don't even actually think it's stupid. I just, it doesn't stick. And then Mm -hmm. if one of them does stick, then I go, Ooh, let's actually make a song of that. You know, like, and the, and the barometer for me is, is I guess to always be playing with those ideas. And then if something actually moves me rather than just being like a a dumb ditty, then uh, it's worth turning into a a song. Got Uh, it that's kind of the process. Yeah. No, that's yeah. fascinating. I, I, yeah, I love it. I love hearing it. Um, and it's kind of like, I feel like any creative endeavor, it kind of starts like that, right? You have to just throw a lot of things out and then you will naturally refine them based on the vibe that you're trying to set internally and, and mm-hmm. find those, those things. I've heard people describe it as like you sort of, you're, there's kind of a wave and you kind of like, sometimes it just kind of like those frequencies align and it's out there. Um, but that's, that's fascinating. I like the fact that it's a little bit more, it's not just like, Hey, anytime I wait for inspiration to hit me, it's like, you go find it. I do go find it. I mean, it, it will still come find me, 
Um, and when that happens, I try to not let it go. I try to, to either stop what I'm doing or write the song if I can. Now that I'm a parent, that's more difficult because you can't mm-hmm. be like, oh, hey, kid, are you eating dinner? And I'm thinking yeah. of a song. <laughs> well, good luck. You know, like, I got to leave. Yeah. No, that doesn't really work. But, um, but I guess, like, yeah, when it comes, I try to take hold of it and, and um, receive the muse, so to speak. But then I also do go look for it actively because uh, somebody had a quote that said, the muse likes to find you working. And I think that's that's completely true. Like a lot of people yeah. sort of are like, well, I'll, I'll write when when something really hits me. And like, I find that if you start writing, something will hit you and then it will just get better. Um, it's sort of the inverse of what pop culture teaches us, which... I don't know how that myth got started that you're just like, I was on a hike in the woods, man, doing acid. And I just had this brilliant idea for a song and now it's a number one hit. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that is not all the information. Right. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to do some work to try and to try to get yourself to a non non-judgmental place where not every song or idea has to be precious or genius. Um, but it can just be something that you find interesting and maybe you keep it and develop it or maybe you don't, but you know, your mind is endless. So mm-hmm. don't feel like the good ideas are in short supply. Yeah. No, I love that. I think, um, it, it's a good point too, about maybe not being too precious. I think that's, that's so important and something that's sometimes stifling is when you're like, ah, this has to be the, you know, the most clever, perfect thing that's ever been written and then by the time it's been refined to a point where it's actually not even interesting at all anymore whereas the some of the more organic stuff is so the preciousness mentality is um an incredible trap and um i think the artists who make stuff that we like and and that becomes precious have really found ways to like take the pressure off and just make make what they like, make what they think is good, put their heart into it in like a free way rather than in a like, Oh my God, what's the world going to think of me if this right. sucks? You know, yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to hear it if it sucks and don't worry about it. Just make yep. the next song and try to make it better. You know? Yeah. That's advice that I need to hear all the time. Because every <laughs> time I put anything out, I'm like, this sucks. Like by the time, and this is after like days of work, I'm like, this sucks. But better do it better just publish at some point otherwise you got nothing to show (laughs) so you can get better on the next one yeah um i know you're doing um a 22 songs for 22 right yeah that's happening uh, yeah 22 singles that i'm putting out in 2022 amazing can you talk a little bit about like where that idea came from and and how it's going yeah the idea came from uh two places one was I was just trying to think about how to like jog the Spotify algorithm a little bit um, because you put out a record and you put in a lot of work and um, you know, months or a year of planning and then everything in your life musically is about this record. And then if it gets traction on the internet, awesome. And if it doesn't, well, you just kind of blew a year, you know? Right. So, um, so I've done that and had it, had it go both ways, go great and also go like, uh, I don't know. So I thought, well, I should do some singles because that's how I listen to music anyway. And that's what Spotify is always pushing. And they have a function about release radar. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I am somewhat familiar. I know from a consumer perspective. Um, okay. Yeah. So yeah, basically if you, this is the, pr- the promise they make is one that they have broken. Um, which I'm now finding out. But basically it's that if you release a single and over a week in advance submit it for playlist consideration, it automatically gets fed through through release radar playlists to your followers. So I thought, well, I can put out a song every two weeks and just be getting blasted to release radar all the time and people will listen to it and share it. That has not proven true, um, even though I do the steps that they have articulated. Right. Um, they did do it one time and I got thousands of plays like overnight. And I was like, well, this is killer. 
Yeah. Why, why, why only that song? You know, that was like, was the eighth single I put out. I put out 10 this year thus far, but I'm sorry. I got in the weeds there. No, this is great. This is great. This is what, this is what I was thinking about as I thought about how to share the music that I had been making. And, um, I thought, well, I'll do 12 singles in 2022, release one a month. And my wife was like, well, that's too easy for you. You should do more. How about 22 (laughs) for 22? Um, and I thought, wow, you're, (laughs) that's tough love, but like, but yeah, um, but it's been a really fun project and, um, and also overwhelming because there's a lot of music to record. And I will say like, I've written so many songs, it's not so hard to like pick ones to record. Um, but just like trying to get a good recording that really captures the spirit of the song, um, is harder maybe than writing it. Um, or at least for me at this point, I, I couldn't agree more. I've um, got a lot to ask you about that, honestly. Oh, okay. Sure. Well, we're here. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the premise was just like, get a bunch of stuff out, sort of also catch up on recording songs that I had already written that weren't out, but I would play live. People would ask about, and I'd be like, well, you can't listen to it anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's the premise of 22 and 22. Love it. Um, well, it's great. It's a great, it's a great thing and it's going strong and I know you're, you're, you're moving through it quickly. Um, and it's, it's exciting. It's one of those things, um, the modern kind of way of music distribution is really changing. Um, and there's just like so many different ways to try to approach it and to, and to find your audience and niche. And, and so you got to get creative like that, which I love. It's very cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um, in terms of production and recording, do you, how do you typically approach that? Do you do a lot of it yourself? Do you have a team that you work with? Do you, um, I, I'm couldn't agree more that I think sometimes writing the song might be the easier part because the production just feels like there's infinite endless tweaking. It never quite hits the microphone. Like I want, I'm, I have a very rudimentary system, Um, but I I always feel like there's something just a little different or off. And then there's a a million decisions to make within it um, in terms of like which tones and things I want. Um, I find it to be almost harder. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a few systems I would say that I use now. And, um, and it's been like kind of a journey to, to get where I am. And, And I also see that there's a lot further you can go. I don't feel like I've like arrived or anything. Um, I produce a lot of stuff on my own and the way that works is basically me sitting in this room. I have a nice microphone and a very simple preamp and um, I would say a now pretty functional understanding of um, signal chain, signal flow, production choices you can make on your own without a lot of gear, just Mm -hmm. using basic plugins. I always tell people it's better to like have simple gear that you know really how to use well than to have bought too much stuff and like not understand how a compressor works, you know? Right. There's a lot of that. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I just, I try to keep it really simple and I try to, um, know a lot about the tools that I have at my disposal. And, um, I, I can, I can play a few instruments on my own, like, you know, guitar, bass. I also play mandolin, some piano. Um, I can sort of piece together drum parts by hand and quantize it or, um, or using, you know, like a drum machine. Yep. So, so I can make a lot of things just on my own. Um, but I do find that it gets stagnant if if i'm the only one oh and i also i can sing harmony parts too um so like i could make a whole track on my own but i think that that's less interesting a lot of the time Mm -hmm. than collaborating so i have a group of people that i work with for different things and you know a handful of people that i've just met over the years in that play different instruments and i'll call on them for different parts and i think about it think about each song sort of like casting for a movie like just because this guy is my friend and plays guitar doesn't mean he's good for the role in this song right like 
I'm going to call this other person who I know less well, and I'm going to pay them to play the part because they're going to nail it on the first try, and it's going to take less time overall. And maybe we don't have, like, uh, the deepest friendship. You know, it's more of a professional relationship. But again, you're casting for a movie, and so, like, you're going to call Tom Hanks when you need a friendly old guy. Um, yeah. Or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's kind of how I think about putting the songs together. Um, so if I, because I'm doing so many this year, I can't always keep up on all the productions. So there are times, been a few songs where I just record my guitar and vocal at home and I just send that very minimal to um, a friend in Nashville and he does the rest of it. And sometimes I give him direction and sometimes he just wings it and it's cool or we talk about how to make it better. But yeah. his name is John Estes and he's the, he's the other producer of my stuff besides me. Great. Yeah. I think, I think it's so valuable to just in music to, to share with other people um, because the journey becomes that much more interesting. And as a listener, I think you hear, you start to hear like these different personalities, even though it's one song, you kind of get all these different flavors and, and then not to mention, like you said, I think there is a, something about um, not being able to do it all, all the time. And that's okay. Um, that's something that I'm not necessarily good at. Um, but you know, like it is good to just share the production work sometimes when you, you've, you've got a bunch of live shows you're playing and then you, you're working on 22 originals and can't do it all, all the time. Yeah. Um, it becomes a, a really interesting question of like, what, where is this music going? How is it going to be released? And, um, what are your goals? And then also like, how much free time do you have? Do you have like more time than money or more money than time? Um, I think about that a lot because there will be some weeks where my schedule is slow and I'm like, well, cool. That's a good week to, to record stuff like, yeah. you know? Um, but then other times like I'm slammed or I'm on tour and it's way easier for me to like pay someone a hundred bucks to do an overdub than it is for me to find the time in the day. Um, based on yeah. the release schedule. So totally. yeah, that I also think, I mean, I see, I see you have a few instruments back there and like, it's part of the learning process to do it all yourself too. Yeah. Um, so I think depending on the project, like for me, all these songs like have to be ready to go on the radio as soon as they're done. Like they just have to be polished at a certain level mm -hmm. that, um, that I'm happy with. And that, um, you know, audio quality wise and just like level wise, it can go anywhere and it will sound good against any other record you hear. Right. And I can do that on my own, but it takes more time than if yeah. I <laughs> selectively collaborate, you know? Yes. So, yeah. so like, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just depends on what you, what you want to do and practicing it and maybe not hitting the mark every time is a, is also a great use of time. Yes. If what you aren't doing is like creating on a deadline for public release. Right. But I guess you're yeah. kind of, you're kind of doing, you kind of are creating on a deadline for public release all the time. I'm trying. Yeah. yeah. That's the goal. <laughs> I, I've come to a point where I just want to make a lot of things and essentially fail fast. Um, because I, I'm typically unhappy with most of the things after they're done. Mm. Um, but I have so much fun doing it and I have so many ideas that I want to do. And so I just know that if I keep doing it and failing forward, I, so to speak, um, hopefully I can just get better. Um, I probably do need to like get over my ego though and sit down with somebody that actually produces music. Cause I've never done that. And I've literally, I mean, I've watched maybe the world record amount of YouTube videos and about production, but um, it would be nice to have, I, I, I got to find someone that knows what they're doing so I can like hear what real leveling is like and what it means to like make something like that. But, um, if you want to do something online with somebody, I could recommend a couple people. Yeah. If you don't um, mind, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's amazing. And I think YouTube's a great resource, but like a YouTube video won't give you feedback or yes, tell you like the why they made that decision. Yep. So, or like how it pertains to your particular setup and signal flow or the room right. you're in. So yeah, anyway, 
you know, you no, know, I would love we're that. talking about yeah. the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. And I, I think to your point, what I liked the point that you made though, is that by doing it all, you do under, you, you have a working understanding of it all. Maybe I won't be like, I'm not never going to be like maybe a mixing or mastering engineer. Um, but understanding like the basics of like why compressors work and why different EQs are applied, um, because I done it and failed and learned, um, is really important. It's a good thing to know for different instruments, for different mics, for all the kinds of things. So it's in the same camp good. for me as learning music theory. Like it's just, you got to be able to communicate with the engineers who are working mm -hmm. on your stuff. And mm -hmm. if you don't have any clue and you're like, Hey, that, that, uh, that crackly sound, you know, just just somewhere in the mix. I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's harsh in my mellow. Yeah. Like that's not enough information to make a useful adjustment. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's all helpful. Cool. Um, the last kind of subject I wanted to quickly cover, um, was sort of, um, playing live your experiences doing that. It sounds like that's basically how you started, right? You kind of were, were playing bars and, and that is kind of, is that the main source of, of kind of revenue for you and everything that you do that is wrapped around that experience? Yeah. Playing live is my main source of, of income. And, um, that is terrifying to me now because of the, the panini, as I call it, the pandemic. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, just like that. It was, it was a weird couple of years kind of trying to, to juggle that. Um, and to still play out outdoors when that felt safe. Anyway, I don't yeah. want to get in the weeds on it, but yeah, I started out playing backyards and like sort of like punk house, like basement shows and garages and stuff. Just, just right after college, um, it was DIY touring, I would say. Yeah. And that was sort of the world in new England that I was, um, I guess growing up in, although I was already in college, so I was somewhat grown, but <laughs> musically I was growing up there. Yeah. And, and then, um, I started a string band and started playing like farmer's markets. And then that like very quickly actually went into like theater shows where we were like opening for people for like, oh, cool. you know, two or 200 to 300 seat places. Yeah. yeah. And so I kind of saw like, oh, you can like basically start at the bottom and not get to the top, but like get to a working, working band status, you know, like yeah. you, you can have an audience, people will like it if you kind of present stuff well and learn how to put your best foot forward on the internet. Um, so I saw that happening and then that band split up and I moved to Colorado where I, I had already lived, where I've lived is kind of a zigzag story. So let's forget about that. But I was living in Colorado and there, there wasn't really this like backyard concert culture and the only venues around here were like belly up the Wheeler opera house yeah. and just places where you have to, you got to be able to sell 300 to 500 tickets or whatever. And that wasn't me. So what, what were my opportunities? And there were bars, there were all these bar gigs and people going out after skiing and, um, here on vacation and also a lot of private parties. And I knew all these country songs and folk songs and bluegrass songs. And, um, just, I think by coincidence, my experience and interest musically overlapped with what people wanted, um, from that, from hanging at a bar in Colorado. So, um, so yeah, I just started gigging and it, and through that I saw, well, one, I saw a lot of ways to improve what I was doing <laughs> and, uh, and, I like wasn't good. At, I great. wasn't good at it off the bat. Yeah, and I, I had to put yeah. in a lot of work to try to get better. Um, there were a lot of other musicians around here too, to like kind of learn from and, and, um, there's a culture, but there's also, uh, sorry, there's a music culture, there's a scene, but there's also a scene of people who I feel are a little bit like trapped in their bar gig mm -hmm. kingdom. And I saw that and I was like, I don't want to be that, but I yeah. want to, learn how to get good at it and then see what the next thing is. So anyway, I started making a living doing that. And that was the first time I really made any money as a musician. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't like killing, but it's like very kind of middle-class living. And you're like, Oh, you can do this. This yeah. is, you can do it. If you work hard and you sound good, people pay you. Oh, that's, that's insane. Yeah. Um, 
And then after that, <laughs> sorry, there's all these chapters. Maybe no, it's, you it's cut great. me off if I'm talking too long. But, no, please. Um, I moved to North Carolina with my girlfriend, who now we're married, and um, and I was got, started working at a venue to learn about the scene. And I saw that there were all these songwriters playing for like 50 to 100 people in these rooms, and I was running sound for them, and I would talk to them about their work and their business and their music and I loved so much of what I heard and I just was like oh my god like that looks great I could I can do that let me figure that out you know so that's that was kind of the start of me working on myself as a songwriter and as a performer and um like someone who like if you're playing a bar gig your job is to be the background music right your job is to like facilitate somebody else's good time right but they're not going to focus on you and that's totally cool Mm -hmm. uh they're usually not going to and a listening room or like a concert series where someone's going to pay a ticket to come hear you is really about like facilitating a connection between you and them and the music and um there's so much more focus involved and i just really wanted to be like worthy of that seat and and being in that position. And so once I saw it happen, happening in North Carolina and I was like, oh, this is a thing you could do, I kind of reoriented my performance and all the gigs that I, or most of the gigs that I was taking to try to put myself in that seat. Amazing. Um, thanks for sharing. Is, share- is I mean, that amazing? What's yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's cool. I am amazed. I um, I just think it's cool that you you made it happen and you took all these different journeys and found the different different ways and then kind of perfected in the way the there's a business side to everything and and just understanding that even though there's art always um there has to be a way to make money somehow to do it um so it's pretty cool well i had a lot of side jobs like before i started doing it for full full time and um i you know i just like i love music so much and I love making music so much that I was like I think my best shot is to do it full time because like I'm gonna I care about it so much yeah. um, I think that's a huge advantage um, musically artistically and then also um, I see that you can like <laughs> I don't know, it's it, there's just like you you work really hard right now I'm I'm at a place where like I'm doing okay things are cool I'm like so fortunate in so many ways and then I also see all the other ways that it could grow. And um, there's just always room for improvement, even if you're not trying to be a pop star, which is not my thing. Um, but yeah, it's musicians are very self-critical, you know. Um, even though when I sort of zoom out and I look at my life and I like look back on how my life has musically changed in the past five or ten years, I'm very proud Mm-hmm. But uh, as I look forward, I'm like, here are all the, <laughs> here are all the things we got to do, you know? Yeah, you and, know. And that's endless, and, and everybody's doing that, regardless right. of where they are in their career, so. Yeah. Yep, you know, the struggle is the journey sometimes. If you didn't have it, there wouldn't be anything. But, um, yeah, that's that's a really great perspective to have, and thanks for, for sharing it. Appreciate it. Thanks um, for having me on your show. Yeah. I'm I'm honored and this is very cool. I I'm so excited to have I mean this is amazing cuz I I'm, I'm went on a tear listening to your your thing so I'm sure you've gotten a bunch more Spotify streams helping you out there. Thank you for the penny um, and a half. That, uh, yeah, exactly. Spotify Whatever sends that my way. amounts to. Um, that's yeah, but, that's not on you. <laughs> I want to contribute in any small way I can. Um but that's great. So um, the way that I close these kind of things, there's, um, two kind of a little bit more geared to the Instagram, TikTok style, um, of promotion here. So, um, the first one is a 30 second rapid rundown. We haven't had anyone <laughs> achieve it yet. P- mostly my fault because I've been slow at, at asking the questions and things, but essentially I just ask, I'm asking a bunch of rapid fire questions that are kind of like one or the other. And, uh, just seeing if you can get to 10 in 30 seconds. Let's try it. You want to try it? Yeah, Let's of course do it. I do. All right. I'm kind of a so, slow talker, so you're at a disadvantage. No worries. 
All right, ready? Who knows? Set, go. Okay, home cooking or takeout? Home cooking. Formal or casual? Casual. Star Wars or Lord of the Rings? Star Wars. First album you ever bought? Uh, at, not Abby, Sergeant Peppers. Instrument you wish you could play? Fiddle. Favorite park? Tot Lot Park. Best music city? Austin. Books or TV? Books. Uh, favorite Disney movie? I don't know any Disney movies off the top of my head. There's time. I think we got to nine. So that might be the uh, record. Uh, That's the record right now. So, so one day someone will get it. Uh, and last two kind of closers here, which have been a lot of fun. Um, we call them 60 second ponders. Um, we play <laughs> your music in the background as, as you ponder these um, prompts. They're somewhat strange. Um, they're meant to be sort of weird, different. Um, the only goal that you have is just to fill the 60 seconds as your song plays in the background that happens in post. Um, okay. And um, you could pass, though, if you want, but you um, that means that you don't get the, the extra love on your song, and then every time it gets reshared, it gets a play. So it's a, another little mini. Lay, mini, lay, uh, lay it on me. Stream. So um, I will start with the first one. And ready? Ready. Um, what do you think your last words will be and why? Please, dear God, why? Why? I wish, I wish I'd, I'd eaten more sushi. I wish I'd taken a bath in pizza. I wish I had cried more in front of my loved ones. And I wish, I wish I'd given away more money to charity. I wish... I wish I was wearing something cuter. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you do stick with this haircut when you uh, show my corpse, please make it look nicer. Um, tell everyone I love them and I care about them more than I could ever say. It's been so wonderful being with you here on Earth. Let's French. Is that 60 seconds or not quite? Nailed it. You were right on. <laughs> you were right on. That was perfect. And that was hilarious. That was super funny. That's good. Um, all right. I got one more of those, and then you're, you're free to go on your way. Um, let's see. All right. 60 seconds on the clock here. All right. Round two. Uh, if you could create a new holiday that doesn't exist, um, which one would it be? Mm. Stranger Appreciation Day would be great, where you are just oh. super nice to strangers, giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. It could also be sort of like a non-judgment day. I find myself, uh, you know, you see somebody and you're like, yep, that's a skater boy. I don't know. what You just pick pick whatever box you want to put someone in. And your job for the day is to dismantle your boxes and just be sweet to each other without any pretext, except uh, maybe just going the extra mile. You know, that's, I would love to have a holiday that is about that. I kind of feel like Thanksgiving is that, except it's more family centered. This would just be for total strangers. Just love everybody. Radically love everybody. Radical love day. There you go. Perfect. Nailed it. Right on time. You have the sixth sense for the 60 second timer. I feel like I'm watching <laughs> you and you're kind of like, maybe, you're maybe like, that's oh, he's too. getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I have like my notes on the screen. So that's sort of, I'm turned sideways, by the way. I that's should have okay. explained that before. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm trying I, to look at the camera. I need to fix that setup. But, I you figured know, it was something iterate. like that. I don't mind. 